we're going to go to the CRA and everyone's excited about that one. So to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'm just going to do five facts about the CRA. So last year, the CRA reported on several occasions that accounts were compromised. 100,000 users were blocked out of their accounts without providing, and they didn't provide any details of what was happening. They got breached again this year. And after this happened, account users were given the option to add two-factor authentication to protect their accounts. This was an option. This year, they were hacked again, and CRA officials referred to one attack as credential stuffing. But the lack of details provided by the CRA leave a lot of unanswered questions. So I think in this discussion, we're going to be kind of hypothesizing of what we think happened. And the first question I have is for Julien. Julien, are you excited? It's, <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> ready, I'm ready. So, <laughs> so it seems that password stuffing is a low level attack method. Would having users simply create a more complex password or use different ones across platforms curb the risk of attack? Would that have made a difference in the situation? So the answer is yes. Although for the sake of the discussion, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit because password is kind of the oldest technique of, you know, defense as per se. And it's referred to the old school, you know, opening the door, what's the password? And you say your, your password. It's, it's kind of very old and, and very, not strong at all. So having a not complex password is a problem, but having a pa to, to only use a password is a bigger problem from, from what I think. And just interesting fact, in Quebec, the most used password is Soleil 1, 2, 3, which, which stands for Sun 1, 2, 3 in English. And this is statistic that we have because at Boosaker, we're doing tons of pen tests and ethical hacking engagement and we see the kind of password that people use. And this is sad, but true. So that's one thing. Pass password is, is an old technique that should not be the only one to defend an in, in, in infrastructure. So, and then we always think that having complex stuff, like having a special character will make it stronger. Well, that's not true. <laughs> what is interesting is the number of position in the password is way more important than the complexity of the character that you have. So, and this is basic mathematic. It's, it's exponential where each time you had a position, you made it more complex. So what we say when we're doing kind of awareness with clients and customers, we say you should have a passphrase instead of a, a password because a word is very small where a phrase is very long. And so, it could be like, for example, the Smurf are dancing under the sun while, while it's raining. That could be a very strong password without any special character. But this could take like forever for hackers to, to crack. And, and by the way, you use the, the, the password stuffing. But what we hear more is password spraying, where we're shooting everywhere with everything and, and roaming between and, and doing like... You know, if, if we're trying all the time the same account with different password, it, it will be luck. So what we do instead, we, we being the adversary, let's say what the adversary we would do is he will try one password to every account in the enterprise one by one. And then the second password with all of the account, that way he doesn't get caught by a system that will see that he's trying to do five times the same account, right? So this is password spraying. So the best strategy is multi-factor authentication, which stands for 2FA, MFA, different password, different buzzword. And, and yes, I know it's annoying receiving a text with the numbers that you need to get in, but this is what you know and, and the information you know and the information you have. So this is a, a strong authentication. So uh, the, 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 the recommendation is to have 2FA everywhere as much as possible. And everything that, that, that will offer you like Google, Microsoft, they all and Apple. Apple, I think it's forced by design. You don't even have choice. You have to, to have 2FA on everything. So that is absolutely the best defense <laughs> to and, and, and it's very inexpensive and, and it's very efficient 
I'd say. Thank you, Julien. Now I have to go change all my passwords. It's fine. Fine, guys. <laughs> Louis, you want to add something? Yeah, no, obviously now David Leonard owes my password. I got to change mine as well. So, so let me just kind of flip the question here and I don't want to get in, in Laura's way here, but, but with an organization like CRA, right, we're talking about including multi-factor authentication. Now, does that become a very complex thing to do given the size of that organization, right? I mean, the, for, for me, and maybe Julian, you have the answer, but, or maybe you don't, but given the complexity and, you know, does that become even feasible that an organization that size can implement a standard multi-factor authentication in a feasible time period? Well, it, it, it used it used to be not easy because of the old, you know, physical token you have to deploy everywhere to everyone. Right. But now, everything is cloud, everything is, is virtual, and you have the soft token, and all those companies that I won't name, but we all know them, that they does that kind of, they adapt. Now, they know that if it's too complex to deploy, people won't use them, and the adoption is very important. So nowadays it's very easy to deploy quickly, fast, and you don't even have to install an agent or whatever. It's all pushed by one console. So yes, to, to your question, it is very feasible for any size of company. It's not because you're larger that it's more complex. For sure, you'll, you'll have more complexity while deploying with the architecture and everything, but is it more expensive not to do it? Like, you know, so yeah, I agree in the news and all, all those problems that comes with it. So, yeah. Great question, Louis. Thank you for adding that. My next question is kind of on the same wavelength and just going back to Vanessa. In this case, the CRA, you know, part of the government, they're also implementing all of the new laws and stuff. How is this possible? Well, that's kind of a rhetoric question. We have no idea, but do these new laws apply to the government and is the government responsible for being more transparent with all that is happening with these breaches? Well, I mean, they're definitely responsible to be transparent and transparency is actually one of the 10 privacy principles that are based and or that are embedded into our privacy laws for the private or public sector. That being said, you know, sometimes people ask, or is it illegal, you know, not to inform the customers or stakeholders. In that specific case, as I mentioned, the CRA is a government agency, so they're not covered by PIPEDA, but they're covered by the, I think it's called Access to Information Act, I'm not sure, but for the public sector. And right now, the public sector doesn't have a mandatory notification requirement. So legally, like they don't have to. That being said, there is a policy that was implemented by, I think it was the Treasury Board in 2014. And uh, it's a policy, but it's still something that asks all uh, the government agencies to notify uh, the commissioner and individuals if, you know, if there's a privacy breach. So even though the law uh, doesn't have that requirement, there's still a policy that, you know, organizations have to or should or shall <laughs> follow. And I went on the CRA website just to see, you know, do they have a statement regarding privacy breaches and stuff like that? And they do. And if I may, I'm going to read you a, a short sentence, but they say that our employees have to report any detected or suspected unauthorized access or disclosure of information, disconduct or fraud, and any processes that appear to be vulnerable to fraud. And they say that if we confirm a privacy breach, we act quickly to deal with the incident. If a breach is deemed a material, we inform any affected individuals and the officer and the Office of the Privacy Commissioner. So the CRA uh, do have that statement that they're going to notify uh, people. So Okay, so this reminds me of, you know, when you go on like a company website and they're like, our values is that we're family and we love innovation. And then when you start working there, it's not nothing like that. Is that, the, is that possible for people to write about, you know, these policies about cybersecurity and all that stuff on their website, but then not follow through with it? And if so, is there any repercussions for them? 
I mean, everything is possible, right? <laughs> Then you have to think, is it ethical first? I think that's something that we should keep in mind. And what I see, you know, when I'm working with clients is that sometimes it's not that like companies or federal agencies don't want to um, notify individual of, or give that information. The thing is that sometimes it takes days, weeks to really know, you know, what is the breach, what kind of data that was breached, et cetera. So it takes time, but I get it. And you know, when you're the individual, you're frustrated, right? So sometimes that's also what we're seeing is that it takes time for the company to notify, you know, if there has, has been a breach, what was done, et cetera. So I don't think that from what I'm seeing, most companies want to do good. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to do their best. Uh, but there's still like awareness that we need to do. Sometimes it's regarding like budgets, you know, funds, they don't have enough resources. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for asking my follow-up question. My next one is for David Leonard. So based on how the CRA, the CRA reacted, what are they liable for? And would they have to pay any fines? So with respect to that one, <clears throat> one, we clearly see that personal information has been affected. And I'll speak to in terms of overall, as an information taker and holder, you're responsible from that standpoint. So there could be, uh, if there is any regulatory fines and penalties that develop out of that current scenario, scenario, yes, they would be liable from that standpoint. At the same time, they have my personal information. If I suffer any damages, and then essentially I could file suit. A lot of the times you would see that it could come in from a class action suit, but we have various different scenarios on that particular case. But speaking to how the insurance policy is there to respond for organizations, one is really to try and get ahead of that case. And I think that's why you see organizations, one, really be mindful of how they communicate from that standpoint. So going back to the first crisis management, one, the important is the actual legal aspect. So determine what you're liable for. The second portion is, you know, getting the crisis in, in managed. The other element would be with respect to that notifying. So that cost there is to engage with the firm that's responsible for notifying. That's why if, if we started to receive, you know, notifications left, right, and center, you know, if you went to Home Depot, for instance, there you would have, or if you're a member of DeJarnay, planning to receive notification. And then they would start offering, you know, an element of credit monitoring for, you know, X amount of period of time or in some cases unlimited. Again, these are all aspects that are covered by the insurance policy to reduce that aspect of, you know, one, from a reputation standpoint. So we don't want to start losing clients based on that we have had a breach, but also to, to kind of mitigate that aspect that, you know, we don't have these kind of class action suits, suits develop. And again, it becomes very difficult also to prove damages in that particular case. But again, the idea is that if you had incurred any damages on account that I, I was someone as an information holder had my own personal information, I then suffered a credit risk, then that essentially those could be recoverable from a claim standpoint. 